Greetings from the dark continent, Conscious Caracal here, or Adams van Sale, here once again to shine a light on the goings on down south. And here to join me today for a very interesting conversation is Russell Lamberti. He is an economist and director at Sakelicha, and he's going to be uh, joining me here today to speak about something that I think needs a little bit more focus. I myself am trying to focus a bit more on this angle, and that is not just providing solutions, but helping people think in a certain way when it comes to solutions. So welcome on the show, Russell. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks, Adam. It's really great to be here once again. Yeah, Thank you. Our, our last conversation here on the, on the channel did very well, and uh, I think the people are hungry for not just solutions, but also wanting to know how they can do their part in this. And I think this is a f crucial point to focus on, is that you shouldn't just be waiting for people uh, bigger, smarter than you, more influential than you, the people that uh, are out there somewhere working on solutions. You just have to uh, hope and put all your trust in them. You yourself need to start uh, working on solutions yourself. It's the only way. Uh, what are some of your thoughts there? Absolutely. As a, as a, a friend of mine says, um, you plus one or two other people is the start of an institution. Yeah. You know, the minute you're planning something with someone else and you're coordinating something and you're getting something done, you're, you're part of the solution. Uh, and every institution started with a conversation between two friends. You know, so, uh, so things start from a seed and they can really grow out. And yes, I think, you know, people fund the state. They pay their taxes to government and as a result, and they pay so much money over to government and they say, well, as a result, you guys better do everything for me. Um, and of course, that doesn't happen. Um, I think there's a similar trap that could emerge when you're funding institutions and organizations that you sort of expect that they're going to carry everything. Uh, I think one's got to be careful of that. I think uh, institutions like Afri Forum, Sakelicha, Solidariteit, these are great institutions. They're doing great work, but they are not the be all and end all of everything. Life is big and complex, and problems are everywhere to be solved. And so, yes, people need to get stuck in where they are. And as I say, just, just one or two conversations can start, uh, can start new solutions. Mm. And we're sitting here in a, a tree that also grew from a small seed. We're sitting here in the Afri Forum uh, studio here at Forum Films. And mm. the thing is, Afri Forum also started in 2006 with, I think, three employees and a zero members. Probably three members, the three employees yes. started with the first three members and maybe some of their family members and friends in the weeks that followed. Exactly. But here we are today with three, over 300,000 members, um, but it's not something that happened overnight. It's been years in the making, but also it's only been possible through not just people funding the organization, but people getting involved. The best example of it is the neighborhood watches that we yeah. do and all the branches we have where people are through not being paid, they, uh, they're volunteers and they're doing incredible work in their communities. Uh, through all these branches and security structures that we've been able to establish. But the central key there is people taking action, getting involved, doing something. Yeah. And uh, I think when we look at the bigger picture, I know a lot of people abroad look at South Africa and for inspiration for solutions. But I think we are in this position where we're living in a country that you've described as a de-developing country. So it's not like we have this luxury of just speaking about theory all day, debating yeah. on whether that is that true liberalism, is that a true free market, is that true communism? Yeah. And just in the lab laboratory of ideology, we are kind of forced to start out of necessity to start doing real world solution building and the things that don't work, whether the theory says it should work or not. You got to jettison that at some point if it's experiment after experiment doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So we don't have that luxury. And I think uh, that's exactly what I want to talk about today is the solutions in the real world where the tire hits the road. Yeah, that's, that's a great topic. Um, I think uh, so I've called South Africa a de-developing country. Um, this has been for many years now. Uh, it dawned on me one day, you know, we, we get so used to talking about developing and, and uh, developed nations or emerging markets or uh, these sorts of this sort of terminology and the one thing that it assumes is that there's basically a th th that progress only kind of goes in one direction that that yeah. we go from from underdeveloped to developed and i suppose in some ways you can excuse people for thinking like this because let's face it the world has come a very long way in the last few hundred years just in terms of wealth uh, standards of living uh, general peace and, and kind of prosperity. Now that's, that's very uneven, certainly not the case everywhere in the world, 
but there's been this tendency to develop. I think the 20th century particularly cemented that in people's minds, uh, particularly with places like Japan, South Korea, your, your so-called Asian tigers, places like Singapore and Hong Kong that grew incredibly rich and wealthy very, very quickly in the matter of just a few decades, three, four, five decades, and these places went from being extremely poor to, to very, very wealthy economies and very, very wealthy places. That sort of development obviously comes with uh, disenchantments about modernity and, and what, you know, what, what does that development bring in terms of the loss of perhaps traditions or, or old institutions or, or, or some old values that those, those cultures perhaps used to hold up high. And that's, a, that's a, an important discussion to have, but nonetheless, places got very wealthy very quickly. And so I think it became, uh, it, it sort of became believed that this was the inevitable trajectory of countries and that once you gave uh, certain countries in Africa freedom and, and, and they moved into that sort of, let's call it that post-colonial era, well, they would just get on that trajectory as well. And Southern Africa has slammed the door quite hard shut mm. on that theory, Ernst. Uh, Zimbabwe being a, a very, very obvious example. And you wrote a book about that. Ex uh, we wrote a book, I wrote a book with uh, Phil Haslam on, on the hyperinflation in Zimbabwe. Mm. And basically, from when Robert Mugabe comes into power, the 80s, Zimbabwe starts to essentially deteriorate. You only start to really see it in the 90s. And then by the 2000s, it's kind of rampant uh, de-development. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and Zimbabwe has, has never really recovered from that properly yet. Uh, we'll talk about what happens in de-development. South Africa has, I think, been on a very similar trajectory, perhaps not quite as virulent and, and, and aggressive as the Zimbabwean de-development trajectory. Uh, places like Namibia have been very disappointing post-independence. Uh, post uh, Botswana has certainly done all right. Uh, it's a very small country with mm. far less complexity. Mozambique has certainly not been great you know, over the last 40, 50 years. So Southern Africa is not in good shape and I think uh, has shown, along with places like Venezuela, uh, and, and several other countries, that this, this trajectory doesn't just go in one direction. And you can have several decades, uh, you know, of going in completely the wrong direction. And that forces us to think, okay, this isn't just an inevitable arc of history. You've got to actually do the right things, and you've got to actually put the right systems in place, and you've got to work wisely and soundly in, if, you want to, if you want to grow wealth. Um, so... It's quite uh, sobering for people to understand that you can go the other way, and we've certainly mm. been doing that in South Africa. Yeah, and uh, what you said there is, I think it's just something that's been implanted in our mind when it comes to development. You just think when a country has a railway system done, it's often like a check. Yeah. Now it's in there. Now we have to go to the next project. Now you yes. have a stock market. All right, permanently yes. this country now has an established stock market. Yes. Next, uh, thriving, uh, uh, thriving property market. All right, in there, got it. Next, uh, now we've got skyscrapers. Now we've got bullet trains, and it's just you go from stairs. It's almost like playing a video game. Yeah. Where you just if you go to the next level, you're not going to be demoted back, back to the previous level. You just have to get through every level with uh, and get all the, the challenges, get all the little tick marks. Such but, a sorry, just to just to jump in there. It's such yeah. a such a great way of, of of putting it, and of course, the the point being that. You know, once those things go in, if you're lucky enough to get them in the first place, man, they take a lot of work to maintain. Yeah, yeah. I think that's uh, that's one of the big words uh, that a lot of people have forgotten is just maintenance. You, <laughs> do, you just take everything for granted. I think in many countries today in the 21st century, everything is just there. Uh, your your ancestors paid the bill; they worked hard for it. But now, when it's there, it's there. You, the house is built; we just live in it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the the mentality that uh, a lot of people have fallen there's into. There's a there's a. I know you want to jump into another question, but just to say, there's a there's a belief about wealth that it's sort of this, the static, pot, mm. and either you sort of get some of it or you don't. Mm. But wealth is a is a what is wealth? Wealth is a constant production of value. It's mm. a constant production of value. You have to wake up every day and maintain and produce mm. and recreate wealth, basically. Um, you don't keep the railway line if you can't do that. If you, don't, if, if you can't maintain, if you can't produce enough value to invest and maintain that railway line, that train station, that building, that skyscraper, uh, you lose it. And I think, I think there's, big, there's this very, very dangerous mindset about wealth and it, it infects Southern Africa that wealth exists 
and either you have it or you don't mm. and 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 you got to try and get it yeah. um, rather than human beings create wealth and they can create wealth and they must create it daily and they can find new ways of creating wealth and when they trade and when they solve problems and when they peacefully interact they actually produce more and more wealth mm -hmm. wealth is not the static fixed pie that everyone's trying right. to fight over yeah and i think before we get into the rest of the conversation there's a there's a big thing that needs to get out of the way and that is what is actually causing this de-development i mean you can it's it's one thing being able to diagnose a country mm. with de-development mm. but it's a whole different challenge to now say okay, where is it coming from everyone has their own theories everyone's pointing to different things saying yeah. this is the roots of it this is the yeah. roots of it and as someone that's i think saturated with economics and with all the, the statistics and everything out there on a daily basis mm. i mean you you might be wrong you might be right but from your perspective and what you've seen mm. where do you think the the root or roots of this de-developments are lying yeah i mean this is a tough one and i'll try and be brief on this because mm. we could spend long on this but i think um if if we think that development is the process of creating wealth um and and create and and where society is creating wealth in a broad-based fashion um, in well-functioning markets where people can trade, where people have the freedom to, to explore ideas, entrepreneurial ideas, uh, come up with solutions. Um, and as, as those traded solutions increase and as, as more and more trade happens and as people solve more and more problems for one another, you are essentially creating wealth. As part of that process, you develop capital, you develop physical mm. things we're sitting on two chairs right now that's that's useful right else yeah. we would be having to stand somewhere you drove you on a road <laughs> drove yeah. you on a road we're we're broadcasting through this incredible technology yeah. um so so this has tremendous value uh that 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 is what development is the the creation of this stuff the proliferation of it and then um and then the betterment of it and the maintenance and the maintenance of it yeah. Um, and so de-development is when that is not happening or is not happening enough or is kind of going in the wrong direction. Mm. So what are the sorts of things that diminish entrepreneurial inventiveness and risk-taking and problem-solving? Yeah. Uh, what are the sorts of things that diminish uh, your and my ability to trade services and goods between one another to solve one another's problems? Um, well, uh, certainly excessive market regulation has to be a factor in that. Uh, excessive uh, limitations on, on what entrepreneurs are able to do. Uh, whether they're able to get capital, i.e. funds, to invest depends on how much the state is taxing you. Uh, to, to do a lot of this stuff, we rely on a kind of base of infrastructure. Um, now, some people might want to call that public infrastructure, uh, some people say all well, this stuff should be privatized. The fact is that we rely on roads, rail, air, um, we rely on electricity, yeah. <laughs> we rely communication on technology. communication technology, we rely on water services. Yeah. You know, if you can't get water and electricity into your business, you ain't creating wealth, yeah. <laughs> certainly not very easily. Um, so when these, sort, when these sorts of services start to diminish uh, and start to uh, come under enormous pressure and start to fail, you start getting de-development because it can't facilitate wealth creation and trade. Well, why are our water services failing? Why is electricity failing? We have an enforced state monopoly on water and electricity, uh, and the government has been misallocating capital, under-investing in power plants, uh, giving jobs and contracts to friends and family and cronies, uh, complete wasteful expenditure. No one needs any uh, more unpacking as to what's wrong with ESCOM as just one example. So an excessive centralization of economic control is one of the telltale signs that you're mm. moving in a de-developing direction. Uh, and certainly in South Africa, that's been the case. So um, excessive regulations, excessive uh, control of vital economic infrastructure in the hands of the state is a key issue. Uh, you, know, you can go into all sorts of policies that are gonna bore the viewer, uh, so we, we won't go there. Uh, but but it's not just South Africa, lots of countries yeah. and increasingly over the last couple of decades, 
you have this kind of bureaucratism that has emerged, this compliance culture. You've got to tick 400 boxes bec mm. before you can start a, a company. You've got to comply with this, that, and the next thing before you can trade with someone. These are all kinds of restrictions and regulations that really do hamper wealth mm. creation. Um, and then, of course, you've got additional social factors in South Africa. We don't have a, a strong police service. Our police service uh, is heavily centralized and poorly managed and poorly funded and, and mismanaged. Mm. And as a result, uh, we have a proliferation of crime. That crime also bubbles up from moral deficiencies within the population. Uh, you can't just blame the police. Someone has to go and actually kill mm. someone. Someone has to go and rob someone. There's a, there's a moral uh, problem there. That moral problem combined with poor policing uh, and poor crime uh, solving and so on uh, creates a very violent society. Mm. Violent societies are not friendly to peaceful trade. Um, and wealth creators and entrepreneurs like doing business and like creating solutions in peaceful societies. And so you tend to push people away, people emigrate. We've lost, mm. South Africa's lost a lot of skills. Zimbabwe lost hundreds of thousands, if not millions of skilled people, just devastating to that country. And South Africa's unfortunately suffered a similar fate, not as, not as devastating, uh, but nonetheless a large skills exodus. What are skills? We talk about skills exodus. It's people who can solve problems. It's people who can come up with solutions, get capital, fix a problem, make it happen. Pe people who can make things happen. Yeah. You lose too many of those people, um, you're going to struggle to, to create wealth uh, in, in society. So for all those sorts of reasons, Alan, uh, South Africa is, is de-developing. Let me just say that I think it's the case that, that Zimbabwe de-developed rapidly. South Africa is de-developing quite quickly, but you know what? A lot of the Western world is de-developing as well. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to make this thing where, you know, we're just the same as you and so on. Things are bad. Things have gotten yeah. bad in South Africa. And there's a lot of countries overseas where things are still really good. The quali yeah. quality of life is really good. But a lot of countries overseas, from the U.S. to places like Canada, the U.K., a lot of Europe, uh, countries have in many ways been going backwards through very unhealthy economic policies. Mm. Uh, you know, the creation of inflation and money printing, which concentrates wealth in the, hand of the hands of the few, takes purchasing power away from ordinary people, really causes people to struggle. And uh, I think for, for several years, perhaps even decades now, the West has not exactly been, been racing ahead. Mm. We've got some interesting technology that's emerged in the world in the last 10, 20 years, and micro technology and, and phones and tech and digital technology. No. Of course, very, very good stuff, but, but it's, it's masking, I think, underneath some real problems in these mm. societies. And so de-development is not just a buzzword for South Africa. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, what you described there kind of links up to something I've been talking about for a long time, and that self-Africanization of many countries. Now, self-Africanization is absolutely a mindset. It's a, it is a, a model of government. It is a model of how a, a, a trajectory that a, a nation puts itself on. Mm. And it's something that there, there's no fixed definition, but there are symptoms of it. So for example, the one thing is the blurring of the line between ruling party and government. It mm. just becomes the same thing. When mm. you talk about government, you talk about the ruling party. And it's not just the ruling party that starts thinking in this way. People, regular people start thinking in this way. Yeah. Secondly, and I think James Myberg excellently uh, summed it up, he said in South Africa, corruption is not only excused and not dealt with, it has become mandatory. So in mm. South Africa, yeah. to, do biz to, be, to have a good chance of being successful in business, you need to get your connections right. You need to make uh, alliances within the ruling party, that exact ruling party that is almost synonymous with the government. The, yeah. that, so the next step from the first step well, not the first step, but the first, uh, the second characteristic flows from the first characteristic. First characteristic is that melding fusion between f uh, ruling party and government. Yes. Second characteristic, corruption becomes not only uh, a facet of every uh, part of society, but also becomes mandatory if mm. you really want to be successful. Mm. Thirdly, is that centralization that you uh, described there. Government never gives up power in any way, shape or form, mm. only when it is forced to, never willingly, mm. only when it's forced to through collapse of capacity, which mm. doesn't have any, it, it, it doesn't have a choice there. It yeah. has to stop, for example, 
um, uh, it, it, let's take an example of security. It, it wants to have a monopoly on, uh, on security, but it just can't. Just can't. It, yeah. it doesn't have the capacity. So it's mm -hmm. forced to, to give people more freedom, but it's, it, it ideally would just want to centralize. The other, that's the, the third one, is that just perpetual march towards centralization yes. in the hands of the state. Mm -hmm. Now you combine that with a racial agenda. That's specifically in South by what makes South Africa such a key case mm. study. Because the West is drinking this this poison as well. Mm. This quota representativity system yeah. of every facet of society needs to be reflective of the of the demographic statistics of the country. Yeah. It's it's some of the most absurd it's it's one of the the, the father and the mother of some of the most absurd policies you will ever see in your life. Policies where I have to link people to sources because they don't believe me if I just, just <laughs> yeah. tell them. Um, best example of this is the Tourism Relief Fund mm. in, um, that we saw in 2020, where mm. all businesses are struggling. It's the, whether you are a white-owned, black-owned, from all across the spectrum owned, yeah. all businesses are struggling. Yeah. But the government sets up specifically for the tourism sector, this fund to assist businesses that are on the brink of going under specifically small and medium businesses. Yeah but they bake into it the racial agenda, where yeah. if you own a business, small business, you're just a family business, you are a week away from, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna have to close our doors. Go to the government, you see, this fund is exactly for me, I'm in the tourism industry, exactly, I'm being hit hard, not by the pandemic, by the lockdowns, mm -hmm. we need to be specific, yeah. and by government policies, yeah. and then the government looks you up and down and says, sorry, too white, not, yeah. uh, don't have the right complexion. Wrong color. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Good luck, I hope you have some other skills, learn to code. And that's exactly the, 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 the last one that I wanted to add there as part of South Africanization yeah. is that racial agenda above all else, above all other priorities. The, the, the best example of it is even uh, providing your population with a stable electricity supply takes second priority yeah. after the racial agenda, which uh, you see in ESCOM, for example. And it's this, this racial obsession is unbelievable, hey? And um, yeah, it's, it's really very disconcerting to see it penetrating the, the developed uh, economies of the world, the, the, the rich countries of the mm -hmm. world. Um, in South Africa, and I think this is probably, there, there's, there's subtle differences across all the different countries as to exactly how these things manifest and why precisely mm. they manifest. In South Africa, the racial justification, the, the race-based policy justifications are really just a, an excuse to put some kind of ethical veneer. Mm. Um, uh, and when I say ethical, I mean I think it's unethical, but, but some people believe they can make the ethical argument for, you know, and they, they cite things like racial redress and the past and all this stuff. So they set up this kind of ethical edifice. And really what it does is it justifies the first three things that you spoke about. Yeah. It's, a, it's sort of the moral hook that mm. gets people it's buying. It's a little moral source that they throw. Over buying the, into the, meal, the, yeah. the first three things, which yeah. is the, the, uh, the corrupt state, um, the, 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 the government, the state as, as party and the party as yeah. state that becomes endemic corruption. Yeah. Um, that becomes perpetual um, centralization. Perpetual centralization. That was the third one you yeah. mentioned. Um, and so this is all. It's all kind of part of of that whole process. And and so um, I think when people see these sorts of policies, like the one you mentioned, and there's of course m you know, many many examples. We have uh, we have just a proliferation of race law in South Africa. Uh, ironically enough. Um, oh. <laughs> nearly 30 years after 1994. Uh, excuse me, just uh, to interrupt you there, a great source for people that they can go read is James Myberg's piece, The Many, Many Race Laws of South Africa. Yeah. Great documentation, because I mean, we yeah. can't cover yeah. it all here. It's gonna take uh, the entire day. But I think, I think it's important for people to know when they see these policies that uh, what's really going on there is a, is a justification mm. for the entrenching of state power and really very narrow interests and very, uh, uh, very sort of, uh, uh, concentrated wealth and interest. Um, and that's why we think at Sarkelicha it's very important, and, and I know AfriForum thinks very similarly, uh, you've got you to gotta come against that moral justification very strongly. You've mm -hmm. got to say, we, you know, at Sarkelicha we, we proudly oppose BEE. We think it's a harmful policy. We think it damages <laughs> the, the economy. We think it's not good for the mass of South Africans. 
um, who are suffering under this weight of corruption and misallocated capital and poor economic growth. Mm. Um, and so we can very confidently say that it's wrong, it's harmful, and we oppose it. Yeah. And you know, I've got to say that as you come out confidently with that position, we're starting to see a lot more people um, move over to our side also a lot more confidently. Mm. A lot of corporate South Africa has been very timid to speak out against uh, firstly corruption and then race laws. They're now comfortable to talk about corruption. It used mm. to be taboo, hey? Not, not that long ago. If yeah. you said the, the government was corrupt, it was, it was a very hush-hush thing to have to say. Now it's basically accepted as fact. Well, I'm telling you, we're moving in the same direction on BEE. Ten years ago, if you came out against BEE, you were immediately regarded as surely a racist and surely just someone extre extremely regressive and, and anti-progress. Uh, yeah. um, we're starting to see now that people really get why it's bad and they're starting to get a lot more confident to speak out against it. And that's really encouraging to me. So companies that would ordinarily have shied away from criticizing BEE are kind of stepping mm -hmm. out there and starting to say it. And I think we're in a, a phase now where this, where this starts to snowball. Um, so this maybe looks a little bit forward in this interview to, mm -hmm. to, to where we're going and, and mm -hmm. kind of solutions. Um, but as bad as it's been, and as bad as this de-development has been, uh, I think that as, as people stand up, start, start offering solutions, and start standing against the moral structure, the deficient moral structure and ethical structure on which this is all based, you start to see real progress. Yeah, and uh, I think uh, when you have a strong moral base, you can fight any fight. And I mean, that's, that's something I've learned from working at AFRI Forum, and I'm sure you've learned in your experience at Sarkalicha as well. When you've got that strong, principled, moral base that you can stand on, you can stand firm in, in any battle. Yeah, and, and you know, when you, when you say to people that rather than BEE, what you support is value-based um, and non-racial transaction, non-racial commerce, value-based business, I've not said that to a single person who doesn't agree. Hmm. Everyone buys into that. Yeah. And um, you touched on something very important there in the, in the, the moral facade that the racial agenda pretty much serves for mm -hmm. the government. And nowhere is that more clear than in Carter deployment. Yeah. Carter deployment that the, the government pretty much used to firstly gain control over the entire state apparatus post-1994. So they had to deploy Mm. party loyalists into every tentacle, into every facet, every little corner of the government mm. so that you have control of the entire government machine, the entire Leviathan is under your control. Secondly, opens up all these patronage networks, all these uh, opportunities for corruption, puts a lot of fuel into the tank of the gravy train Correct. and it just goes. That's, but it's all being done under the guise of BEE. So if you... Uh, uh, or a, in corporate South Africa, you've got to have an ANC card as friend or son or daughter on your board. But under BEE, because of, of course you're too white, your management, you need some uh, representativity there. We've got the perfect candidate for you, uh, ANC politician's son. There, party. And there's story after story, scandal after scandal. This is not something that needs uh, a long list of uh, but you know what's, examples. But you know what's fascinating, Adams, is you spoke about that moral veneer that this has provided. Mm. And it's, people mustn't underestimate how powerful that's been. You know, in the late 90s, when the effect of BEE started coming in, I mean, yes, the BEE Act itself was only 2003, you know, mm. implemented in 2004. But really, BEE starts in the late 90s, mid-late 90s. Um, affirmative action comes in. And back then, if you spoke out against this, I mean, you were just anathema. You, you, you were you couldn't have been more fringe, yeah. <laughs> outlying, ostracized. Mm. Um, when BEE comes in proper in 2003 and 4, it gets a ringing endorsement from big business, okay, mm. and then gets voluntarily and wholeheartedly implemented for the next almost 20 years. And okay. it's still going. And it's still going. So the, the power of this moral suasion that uh, gets born in the mid-90s through the South Africa's transition and gets then used to manipulate capital in, in, for political ends, I mean, in, in many ways, is a masterstroke. 
by by the ANC and uh, whatever we want to say about them and how bad at governance they are and all that, whether it was by design or by luck, this system has proved to be incredibly effective yeah. for a government that wants to centralize power. We, we must, in a way, give them credit for that. <laughs> yeah. the, um, but as I say, what I'm starting to see now is that, is that after so much corruption, after so much dysfunction, after so much de-development, uh, an electricity system that's now on the brink of virtual failure, um, I think people are starting to say, okay, you know, the, 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 the game's up, the time's up, this, this moral story has got no more legs. Mm -hmm. um, and as I say, I'm seeing a lot of positive signs out there that people are willing to stand up openly against this and say, you know what, I've, it's, it's enough's enough. It's time to create real solutions, mm -hmm. value-based business, value-based commerce, um, and it's not just in business and commerce, it's in all the institutions of life. We see it in universities, this racial agenda. We see it in schools. Many schools have been very damaged by this hardcore racial agenda. And I really worry about the kind of educational outcomes that come from that and, and the social and moral outcomes from that. But these things are starting to turn. Some of them, some institutions are gone. They're unsalvageable, unfortunately. Some are salvageable and some we're gonna have to rebuild afresh. Um, but I see, uh, particularly in this racial agenda, a real strong change. And you, know, you can see the progression. The party became the state. Yeah. Then we started criticizing it and we could see the problem. <laughs> corruption became endemic. Okay, then you could start criticizing corruption. <laughs> Centralization became a huge problem. What's happened in the last four or five years? talk about federalism, talk yeah. about devolution. This is all bubbling up to the surface. And the last little domino here is, is the race-based laws, and that's going to fall over as well. So in a, in a way, um, I suppose that's offering a little bit of an optimistic message mm -hmm. about where things are going. The effects of all this, we're going to live with for some time. There's no mm -hmm. quick fix here. But I think the tide is starting to turn. Yeah. But then on that note, um, in your own thinking in the past few years, I'm sure your thinking in regards to solutions has gone through a transformation. Uh, what has some of the ways, what are some of the ways that you're, how you approach solutions and how you think about solutions, what has changed in the past few years? That's a great question. I mean, uh, unfortunately, I, I have to admit that uh, yeah, maybe 10 years ago or so, um, I was a vote harder kind of person, mm. you know. If we just vote- the type of person you now <laughs> criticize. <in> the <laughs> if we just vote harder, yeah. Um, we can get out of this mess. Or if we just beg the government more mm. for better policies, we can get out of this mess. Or if we write more really clever opinion pieces in the, in, in, in the, you know, in the business day, um, we'll kind of get through this. Once you start to realize that you have a state that is actively trying to dispossess wealth creators, uh, pull wealth towards itself and its network, and really actually in, in, in a way, basically sabotage the economy. And that that state is exceedingly unlikely to reform itself internally. That it's also quite unlikely to just peacefully give up power in, in an election. And that even if governmental power uh, or governmental control changes to an opposition party, that you still have an entire enormous apparatus of state staffed by hundreds of thousands of people that are loyal to the old order. Okay, so that, that entire issue is, is where you have to say, look, conventional politics, um, you do what you can. If, if there's a system and there's rules, you, you, you do what you can within that system, but you definitely don't rely on it. You definitely don't put all your eggs in that basket by, you know, by, by any means. You, you, what you do instead is you say, we're going to create solutions outside the state. More than that, you say, centralized state power and state control and the expansion of the scope of what the state tries to do, they're not gonna voluntarily shrink that. Mm -hmm. This is a wonderful base of power for people. Who's gonna push back on that and squeeze the state back to where it needs to be? It's not gonna be a foreign power, Ernst. Uh, some people wish it would, but that's not going to happen. Yeah. The state itself is not going to do it. Um, and people hoping that 
that a more liberal or, or more, you know, more small government oriented political party will just cleanly win power and come in and sort of make those reforms, right. I think that's a pipe dream. I think what we've got to do outside the state is say we're going to establish domains of strength and order, whether it's the commercial sphere, the civic or civil sphere, um, whether it's the security sphere and neighborhood watches mm -hmm. and, and, and private security, whether it's the educational sphere with uh, academia and Soltech and, and you know, various other institutions and homeschoolers and so mm -hmm. on. We're going to start creating these spheres of order and when the state tries to encroach on them, we're just going to say no. Mm -hmm. No, you don't get to come here and we're actually going to push back this way. Yeah. And uh, if you want to break our schools, we're going to build new schools and guess what, we're not going to let you come into those. Mm -hmm. And so it's a process now, I think, of seeing the solution as outside the state and actually pushing back in on the state and limiting the state to its uh, kind of legitimate functions, mm -hmm. which I think are far, far, far smaller uh, than, than they are, than what we see today. The good news is that I think we have a, we have a chance here in South Africa. I think, I think overseas, where government power is still incredibly strong, where states have not failed. They're um, pretty competent. They're pretty competent <laughs> and where the reach of the state is incredibly broad and wide and, and the state's tentacles kind of go mm. everywhere. This is very difficult to achieve. I mean, a case in point is what happened in Australia doing, during the yeah. COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Absolutely. What we saw in, in various Western countries during lockdowns, and Australia was one of them, parts of America, um, the way that these governments are able to you know, surveil their populations, the way they're able to control narratives and information mm -hmm. and even transactions and, and you know, financial flows. Justin Trudeau shut down bank accounts of yeah. the, the truck protesters. Um, uh, a power which is not necessarily beyond our own government here in South Africa, but nonetheless, um, we face a state in South Africa that, you said it earlier, they, they centralize if they can, but what's happening is that there's too many, there's too many balls to juggle now. Yeah. They're running out of money, they're running out of know-how, the cater deployment has failed, they've put the wrong people in the wrong positions, and it's all unraveling a little bit. That actually provides us a tremendous opportunity. It, it's not plain sailing. The, the, the collapse of a state that was looking after, you know, sections of society or, or, or areas of order in society, if that just disappears overnight, you better quickly be able to establish order there or else it gets taken over by, by warlordism, it yeah. gets taken over by the next available strongman. You know? So as the state fails, we need to be developing alternative centers of governance, uh, of order. As I say, there's the educational realm, the security realm, the, 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 you know, the business realm. Mm -hmm. the monetary and, and financial transactions realm. And I think, uh, so, so I think that's, that's the way we've got to see that overseas, you're also getting a degree of state failure and state collapse. Yeah. But it's, in, it's not as advanced as here in South Africa mm -hmm. and those governments over there still have a tremendous reach. So the real challenge for places like you know, Europe and Australia and, and, and the United States and North America is for people to start building local institutions um, at a time when the and and solving local problems and establishing local order at a time when the state has not entirely disappeared from those domains mm -hmm. and so there will be perhaps to some degree a little bit more opposition from the state over there and a little bit more clashing so that's a challenge that that people face but decentralized local solutions I'm, I'm convinced are the future um, and as we build up these organizations and press in on the state that's how I see solutions now as opposed to vote harder. Mm. Yeah, and uh, when we're building uh, these solutions and when we're establishing this, the, these order, uh, little bubbles of order, uh, we're not going to be asking permission <laughs> from, the, from the government. Correct. The, so. the idea is that you build um, and, and you're morally justified to mm. build what you need to build yeah. that's in your vital interest. And you can do everything, uh, everything that we described here within the, the bounds of the law. It's not even, uh, it's not asking you to, to risk uh, breaking the law even to do it. Um, what I also find interesting about that approach is, as I said at the beginning of the, of the conversation, we can see from, I mean, you and me both work in the solutions industry, mm. but we alone, the people working for organizations that we, like us, 
can't do it alone. We can't, uh, we can't build the future alone. No. Um, there's going to have to be a fundamental mindset shift uh, with hundreds of thousands, millions of people. Mm -hmm. But that mindset shift is going to have to happen today it's, or yesterday would have even been better yeah. so it's, we yeah. can't wait five ten yeah. years before people best really time was 20 years ago the second best time <laughs> yeah. is now yeah <laughs> absolutely but maybe then to outline that what do you how do you think people need to start thinking in their own personal lives about solutions it doesn't have to be thinking mm. about we need to um, build our own schools or mm. build our, uh, start our own security uh, mm. infrastructure what are simple ways that people in their own lives, if they're busy people, they, have, they work, their jobs, they, mm. they're juggling a lot of things, so they mm. can't go read 10, five, yeah. 50 books yeah. on the subject. Yeah. Uh, how can they simply start thinking in regards to solutions in a de-developing country? Okay, we don't have much time left, yeah. and that's a huge question. So some I think that, that could be a nice way to yeah. end it. So some general thoughts. Um, we spoke a f last year about digging trenches mm. okay given the state of things if you're not fighting for something or fighting something you you're not in the game you're not really in the solutions game okay now i say fight it doesn't have to be you know we, we don't always have to be in war mm. mode but guaranteed where you live and near where you live there's problems <laughs> there's either a crime problem or, a, or a, a pollution problem, um, or a problem in your, an ideological problem in your local school. Yeah. Um, and what I would say to people is, you can't fix South Africa. <laughs> you can't fix the ANC. Uh, you can't fix inflation, <laughs> okay? Uh, what you can do is get involved in winnable fights. Yeah. And a winnable fight can be you and your buddy, um, sorting out the litter problem or the, or the rubbish problem in your street. Okay, that's super low level, but you sort that out and then you maintain that solution so it doesn't get dirty again. And then you get another friend. You get another, another friend. Neighbor. You've just solved that issue. Yeah. Then you, then you raise your eyes a bit and you say, okay, our local school's not in good shape. Is it a winnable fight? Let's go and have a look. You know what? We just need two of us on the, on the, the school board mm. and we can start making influences there. Now, maybe that takes a year, but through a bit of maneuvering and often these little school boards, no, everyone's too busy to bother. Yeah. You get on the board. You sort the school out. You fix the policies. Uh, so I think it's to encourage people to get involved in winnable fights mm. and start, start institutions. Um, uh, and this is, uh, this is my friend Scott Tunga uh, points this out. Start institutions with two other guys, two mm. other people, two other uh, men or women. Um, that's where it begins. And an institution is two or three people solving a problem. Mm. Forget whether you actually registered it as a business or as an organization. That is an institution right there. You're coordinating to fix some, something bigger than yourself and bigger than your, just your own yard. Yes, tend your own garden. But once you've done that, tend other gardens mm. and, start, and start moving up. And so um, I would just want to leave people with a final thought. Get involved in a fight don't just sit back and, and be nihilistic and then think, okay, well, nothing's changing, so I'm going to leave. Start solving winnable fights near you. The, one of the greatest benefits of that, apart from solving the actual problems, is it gives you a great sense of purpose mm. and optimism about life when you start acting positively. Mm. Well, that's pretty much the message I've been sending on this channel for, for years now, is uh, people need to get involved in their own personal capacity. Um, I've said this almost to, uh, in Afrikaans, you'd say, I'm almost boring people with mm -hmm. this now. But there's a big lie that specifically my generation and also the millennial generation were told in school. We were all told that you need to grow up to change the world. Mm. You need to like, be a superhero, yeah. change the world. You need to change your country. Yeah. But you're setting up people for failure. You're telling them to do mm. something that's not possible. It's like telling them you yeah. have to grow up to move Table Mountain to Johannesburg. Yeah. Like it's never going to happen. The, the, the analogy I use is we're telling people to pull off a hill in fifth gear. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you got to start in first gear. Yeah. And if you yeah. can move through the gears, maybe one day you're getting up to fifth gear. Yeah. But, uh, but start small. 
go big. And then look, of course, and, and you know, I kind of have to say this, and it, but I mean it. Mm. That's why I changed my career to come and join Sarkeliche. Mm. People should try and fund more the sorts of institutions that you and I are part of. Yeah. Those aren't the only things they should be funding. They should be doing all sorts of other things. Mm. They should be doing a whole lot more. But what we're able to do in these institutions, the kinds of solutions we're able to bring are really important. They're really powerful. I think that civil society, Sarkeliche, Afri Forum, Solidariteit, and many others have really made a difference have really been able to push back a lot against state power. I think South Africa would be in a lot worse shape than it is now. And I think we're starting to turn the tide and starting to get people behind us. So I encourage people to look at these institutions as a way for them to make a difference as well, in addition to fighting winnable fights where you are. Right. Well, Russell, thank you very much again for a fascinating conversation. This is the type of conversation we would have had anyway in person, but it's nice that we can share it with other people exactly. as well. I think it's important that other people listen in and, and maybe get some inspiration, maybe think about something, maybe someone that list, that's listening here, you just said something that's stuck at the back of their mind. And over the weekend or over this week, they're gonna be sitting somewhere and just going to remember something that you or me said here, and they're going to take action. And that's, uh, that's what we wanna see, is wanna see people get involved and people start making a difference in a true sense, not in the uh, ac online activist sense in, in regards to a lot of people saying, well, I, I raised awareness, therefore I made a, I made a difference. Like, no, you gotta get your hands dirty, yeah. you gotta get involved somewhere, gotta start doing something. And it can be the smallest thing, just yeah. by picking up a single piece of litter outside your house every time you go to work, that's already a difference. So, Russell, thank you very much. I'll definitely uh, be chatting to you again on this channel, so it's not gonna be the last time, but uh, for now, uh, this is where we say goodbye. And uh, my last question to you is just, where can people find you if they wanna read your work or if they wanna see you know, what I, you're up to? I'm at Sarkeliche, sarkeliche.co.za. We, we're doing a lot there. Um, I'm on Twitter, but at the moment I'm, I'm not, needing much of my content to be found. I'm just getting busy doing some things. And, uh, but it, listen, it's always a pleasure having these mm. conversations with you anytime. I really enjoy this. Mm. All right, and that's the end of that conversation. Uh, if you want to also be part of the bigger conversation, you can uh, leave your comments in the comments section. I read all of them, respond to as many as I can. And uh, you can then also, if you want to get involved, uh, you can go to AfriForum's website, go to Get Involved. That's a tab at the top. And uh, in Afrikaans, it is Rock Betrokke. You go to that tab and you'll see all the ways in which you can get involved through AfriForum. You can uh, join a, a branch near you, see what's going on in your neighborhood, in your area. And then you can also uh, become a friend of AfriForum if you live abroad. You can go to Friends of AfriForum, just search that in Google, and you can become a supporter of state proof solutions being pioneered here in South Africa. If you live in South Africa, you can become a member of AfriForum by just going to AfriForum's website and clicking join. It's that easy. And uh, if you like these types of conversations, you can subscribe. Um, you can also share this across social media. I really appreciate it with friends and family if you think they need to hear something in uh, this conversation here today. And uh, I hope something that uh, me and Russell talked about today is going to stick with you, something resonates with you. I hope something that we uh, discussed here makes you think a little and makes, helps you take that next step where you start getting involved and being part of the solution and being a hero and a leader in your own capacity. Don't wait for a, a knight in shining armor or a general de la Rey to appear on the horizon to come save you. You can save your family, you can save your community and you can save uh, your neighborhood. So thank you very much for tuning in. Really appreciate everyone that, uh, that shares this and everyone that uh, takes part in the conversation and everyone that loyally tunes in every time that uh, we have conversations on this channel, I really appreciate it and all your feedback as well. So I hope you have an excellent weekend and week ahead and this will be uh, the end of today's episode. So cheers guys, have a good one and God bless. And a lot of people fighting back against this nonsense. Conscious Caracol, whoever he or she is, is one of them.